The Ontario Diagnostic Days on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, the University of Guelph, Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, and sponsored by the Grain Farmers of Ontario, Agris Co-op, BASF, Bear and DeKalb, Corteva and Pioneer, Great Lakes Grain, The Mosaic Company, and Syngenta. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin and welcome to Ontario Diagnostic Days, episode number three. Today we're going to talk about weed management and uh, we're going to kick things off with University of Guelph weed researcher Dr. Peter Sikama. Peter will take us through a series of glyphosate resistant Canada fleabane research plots and discuss the best products and strategies to control this yield robbing weed in both corn and soybeans. Our next guest is Omafra weed management specialist Mike Cobra. Mike will walk us through a crop injury scenario where soybeans can be affected by carryover from the previous year's corn herbicide. We'll then rejoin Peter Sikama at one of his water hemp research sites in Essex County. Over the past six years, glyphosate resistant water hemp has established a considerable footprint across Ontario and Peter will identify recommended herbicides and management strategies to tackle this troublesome weed. Mike Cobra will wrap up the episode with a look at 2,4-D injury in soybeans, how to identify it and how to avoid it. Again this episode, CEU credits are available for CCAs who have registered for Diagnostic Days. Look for the URL where you can apply for your credits. You'll see that on the screen at various points throughout the episode. We also encourage you to put your comments and your questions in our YouTube comments section as you're watching the video. We'll get those questions, we'll get them to the experts, and we'll get you some answers. Good morning. My name's Peter Sikama. I'm with the University of Guelph Ridgetown campus. And for this portion of Diagnostic Days, I'm going to be talking about uh, the control of glyphosate-resistant Canada fleabane in corn, soybean, and winter wheat. So glyphosate resistant uh, Canada fleabane was first identified from seed collected in 2010 in Ontario. Really interesting, over the next six growing seasons, glyphosate resistant Canada fleabane spread from Essex County in the southwest corner of the province to Glengarry County adjacent to the Quebec border. So in six uh, growing seasons, it would move from, uh, or was found in one county originally to 30 counties. But what makes this uh, weed even more challenging for Ontario farmers to manage is that it's both glyphosate and group two resistant. So now some of our group two herbicides, such as first rate, which was our best post control product in soybean, no longer works. This weed is uh, native to Canada. It's considered to be a cosmopolitan weed and that simply means that it's found around the globe and it's found from 55 degrees north, so approximately as far north as Edmonton in Alberta to 45 degrees south, which would be the southern part of uh, Brazil. However, it's most frequently found in the northern temperate uh, zones in, around the globe. In terms of uh, glyphosate resistant Canada fleabane, this plant grows as either a winter annual or a summer annual weed. So the winter annuals emerge in the fall and then they form a rosette in the fall and the stem elongates in the spring. In contrast to that, the spring emerging plants do not form a basal rosette and stem elongates shortly after emergence. Seed from uh, Canada fleabane, there can be up to a quarter million seeds per plant and the amount of seeds pr produced is pr uh, proportional to the height of the uh, plant. 
So in terms of uh, seed production, it uh, occurs from mid-August to uh, mid-October, and the majority of the seeds fall within 100 meters of the mother plant. But these uh, seeds are wind dispersed, and in a really interesting study done at Pennsylvania State University, seed from Canada flea bane can enter the planetary boundary layer. And if you're not familiar with that, that's the uh, layer above the soil surface, anywhere from 50 to 2,000 uh, meters. And this seed can move up to 500 kilometers in one growing season. So you could have a weed escape here in Kent County. The seed enters the planetary boundary layer and presumably it could land in the Ottawa Valley, right? And so that's what that research uh, shows. So um, in uh, terms of managing this weed, it's a much bigger challenge to manage in soybean than it is in corn. If you just think about it, uh, flea bane is a dicot weed and it's far more difficult to remove a dicot weed from a dicot crop like soybean than removing a dicot weed from a monocot crop uh, like corn. In terms of uh, where you find it in the field, so typically Canada flea bane will be found throughout a field, but it is most common on sandy soils and on those sandy knolls in, uh, in your field. So uh, typically that's where you would have the uh, greatest uh, weed pressure. Uh, Canada flea bane forms a transient seed bank in the soil and most studies would conclude that the seed either germinates or degrades in the soil within two or three years after seed shed. Having said that, there's one study in the literature that has uh, indicated that Canada flea bane seed can remain viable in the soil for up to uh, 20 years after uh, seed shed. So here you can see the impact of glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane interference on soybean canopy development. So this is one of the uh, control plots and in the re research that's been conducted in Ontario, on average in the experiments that we conducted, there's a 65% yield loss in soybean due to glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane interference. I want to stress that the actual yield loss varies from as low as 1% up to 99%, and that is totally dependent on glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane density and the relative time of crop and weed emergence. If the crop comes up before the weeds, generally speaking, there isn't a large impact on soybean uh, yield. And in contrast to that, if the soybean, or sorry, if the Canada flea bane's up before the soybean, then the uh, yield loss can be quite dramatic. So now if we go over here, here's a herbicide treatment, as you can see, that has given near perfect weed control. And notice the difference in uh, soybean canopy development just based on a good weed control program. So now I'd like to go over here And in the uh, 10 years of research that we have uh, conducted in Roundup Ready Soybean, Identity Preserved Soybean, I think the best herbicide treatment for the control of glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane is Roundup plus Aragon plus Sencor plus Merge applied pre-plant. And here you can see the uh, level of weed control that uh, you would get with that uh, program. I do want to stress that one of the things I've learned in terms of all of the research that we've conducted is that weed uh, control is variable. And in most of our trials, we will get greater than 90% and most of the time greater than 95% control with that three-way tank mix. However, there are individual experiments that we've done where the control has been less than 90%. And then if you uh, go over here, and in Extend Soybean, uh, Dicamba provides good control of glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane. 
However, the control is very much rate dependent. In the trials that we've conducted in Ontario, if you apply dicamba at 300 grams per hectare, our average control is 80%, at 450 it's 88%, and at the high label rate of 600 grams per hectare, the control goes up to 95%. However, once again, it's not consistent, and we have experiments even at 600 grams per hectare where the control is not commercially acceptable. And so we have concluded that we need another effective mode of action in the tank. And in the work that we've done, the uh, most or the best tank mix partner with Roundup plus Dicamba is uh, Aragon. And that three-way mix has consistently provided greater than 95% control. So in this uh, particular experiment, we were, the objective was to determine which of the group four herbicides are most effective for the control of glyphosate-resistant Canada fleabane. So here you can see the density of the Canada flea bane in the uh, control plot. And I'm gonna move down here, and the first group four herbicide we evaluated was uh, dicamba. And I want you to notice that there are some uh, weed escapes with uh, dicamba. That is at the high rate of 600 grams per hectare. And as I mentioned earlier, I think dicamba is a very good herbicide for managing flea bane and extend soybean but on its own, it's not always perfect. In this uh, plot here, we applied 2,4-D at the labeled rate in Ontario as a pre-plant application. And I'm sure all of you would be disappointed in this uh, level of uh, Canada flea bane control with 2,4-D. And this is actually quite consistent with previous research that we have completed in Ontario. In the last uh, couple years, there's a new herbicide that came on the market from Corteva. This happens to be Elevore. And Elevore, as you can see, is better than 2,4-D, but it's not as good as Dicamba. And so then, what we did in this uh, plot over here is here we uh, tank mixed uh, Dicamba and 2,4-D, and you can see near perfect control of the glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane. I'm sure many of you that are listening to this video would say, so why would you combine two group four herbicides? And I think your immediate reaction would be is that's poor product stewardship, Peter. And uh, really interesting, in some of the more recent research that has been completed, it's thought that the different herbicide families within the group four herbicides so you have the benzoic acids like dicamba, you have the phenoxycarboxylic acids like 2,4-D, and the aeropicolinates like elevore. And it's thought that they bind at different sites in the plant, and therefore you can tank mix group four herbicides and not select for herbicide resistance. And once again, as you can see, this tank mix of uh, dicamba and 2,4-D is performing really well in the field. In this uh, particular experiment, we're looking at two really old herbicides and seeing what level of glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane we can get in a soybean. So in this uh, particular plot, this is where metribuzin has been applied. And I'm sure all of you would agree with me that is pretty disappointing control of glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane with uh, metribuzin. Now over here, we used another really old herbicide, bromoxynil, which you may be more familiar with with Pardner. And once again, we applied it at the label rate that you would use in corn post-emergence. And you can see that the control is quite disappointing. And right over here, we put the two together. And this is the uh, second year that we're doing this uh, research. And the tank mix of bromoxynil and metribuzin applied pre-plant in soybean is providing really good control of uh, glyphosate-resistant Canada flea bane. 
So I want to stress, I'm not sure that bromoxynol metribuzin is better than Aragon uh, metribuzin or Aragon Sencor. However, I think that for the first time, we may have a pre-plant burn down in azuki beans. Both bromoxynil and metribuzin are safe to use in azuki beans, and we can get near perfect control of glyphosate-resistant Canada flea bean. So in this uh, particular experiment, we looked at four group four herbicides. We had dicamba, or you, you would buy it as Ingenia, Fexapan, or Extendamax. Then we had 2,4-D, Elevore, as well as uh, Blackhawk, which is a combination of a group 14 and a group four herbicide. And the question we were trying to address in this experiment is, what is the best tank mix partner with a group four herbicide? So in this particular experiment, dicamba provided excellent control on its own, and there was really no benefit of adding either Aragon or Sencor. However, in contrast to that, this is Blackhawk applied by itself. And I think you would agree with me that's disappointing control. And then right beside it, just a four rows over, you can see the benefit of adding Aragon to a Blackhawk and you can see near perfect control. And similarly, over here, we added uh, Sencor to Blackhawk and got near perfect control. And the results were similar for uh, 2,4-D as well as Elevore. It really didn't matter whether you added Aragon or Sencor. The control was nearly perfect with both tank mix partners. And I would suggest to you that you go to your farm retail outlet, see whether you can get Aragon or Sencor at a lower price per acre. And that is the tank mix partner that I would recommend. So uh, here we have a field of uh, corn with glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane. Really interesting, the yield loss in corn due to glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane interference is really similar to the yield loss in soybean. In the trials that have been conducted in Ontario, the yield loss is anywhere from zero to 99%. And the average yield loss is about 65%, just like I said in uh, soybean. As I mentioned earlier, it is easier to manage glyphosate-resistant Canada flea bane in corn than it is in soybean. That makes sense. It's easier to remove a monocot, or sorry, a dicot weed from a monocot crop, or you could say a broadleaf weed from a grass crop, than it is to remove a broadleaf weed like flea bane from a broadleaf crop like uh, soybean. In previous research that we have done, the best herbicide treatments applied pre-plant in corn are things like uh, Roundup plus Integrity, Roundup plus Callisto plus Atrazine, and Acuron. So those are our best uh, pre-plant herbicides. And then in terms of post-emergence weed control, the dicamba-based herbicides so you can buy that as Ingenia, Fexapen, or Extendamax, distinct marksman. They work really well post-emergence in corn, as well as Pardner plus Atrazine. And then a new herbicide, uh, Shieldex plus Atrazine, provides very effective control as well. We're looking at the control of glyphosate-resistant Canada flea bane in corn prior to seeding corn based on the height of the Canada flea bane. So the herbicides were applied when the flea bane was up to four inches in diameter or height, or the exact same herbicides were applied when the flea bane was up to eight inches in diameter or height. So here you can see the density of the glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane in this uh, particular experiment. And the first herbicide that I'll show you is Acuron. And here is Acuron applied when the, the uh, flea bane was up to 
four inches in height and notice the excellent control with Acuron applied uh, pre-plant to the uh, flea beam. So in addition to Acuron providing excellent control of uh, glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane pre-plant in uh, corn, in this uh, particular plot Marksman was applied when the flea bane was up to four inches in height and you'll notice excellent control of the flea bane with Marksman and similarly the uh, activity was compared to uh, Shield X plus Atrazine and notice once again the excellent control with uh, Shield X plus Atrazine. Then in this uh, particular plot we delayed the application until the flea bane was uh, 8 inches in height. Here you can see one of the uh, carcasses and Acuron did provide very good control even when the flea bane was up to 8 inches in height and Marksman as well provided uh, excellent control of the uh, flea bane when it was up to 8 inches in height. Notice the excellent control in this uh, particular plot with uh, Marksman. Really interesting though with the uh, Shield X plus Atrazine you'll notice that the control fell off when we delayed the application until the weeds were up to 8 inches in height. So in this uh, particular experiment we're looking at the interaction between group 5 or photosystem 2 inhibiting herbicides and group 27 uh, herbicides or the HPPD inhibitors. And specifically we're going to look at the activity of uh, Callisto when it is tank mixed with either atrazine or bromoxynil partner which are both photosystem 2 inhibitors. And the basis uh, for this research as you know in some areas of Canada specifically Quebec and in some areas in the United States the use of atrazine is under review. And so the interest is, is can we maintain the activity of the group 27 herbicides by adding a different photosystem 2 inhibiting herbicide to the tank. So in this uh, particular experiment here you can see the glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane density in the uh, control plot. And in this uh, particular ex uh, experiment uh, Callisto on its own provided quite good control but probably not commercially acceptable for a grower. And then we'll move down over here. Here's where atrazine was applied and I think uh, you would agree with me that's pretty disappointing control. However when you uh, combine both uh, Callisto plus Atrazine notice that there's near perfect control of the glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane. And so the reason why you tank mix a group 27 herbicide with a photosystem 2 inhibiting herbicide is the photosystem 2 inhibiting herbicide like Atrazine they increase reactive oxygen species in the plant those reactive oxygen species break cell membrane cell contents leak out and the plant dies. When you add a group 27 as a tank mix the group 27 herbicide reduces carotenoid development in the plant which ultimately reduces plastoquinone and tocopherols and they reduce the ability of a plant to neutralize reactive oxygen species in the plant. So Atrazine increases reactive oxygen species, the group 27's decrease the ability of the plant to neutralize them and that's why 1 plus 1 equals 5 or you get a synergistic response when you put uh, a group 27 herbicide with a group uh, or a photosystem 2 inhibiting herbicide. However what would those farmers in Quebec do that can't use uh, atrazine? And so here you can see the activity of uh, bromoxynil by itself. Once again that's not commercially acceptable but bromoxynil has the same mode of action as atrazine and notice really interesting you can take uh, atrazine out of the tank and apply Callisto plus uh, bromoxynil and get near perfect control 
of glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane. Mike Cobra here with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, we're going to look at a uh, herbicide injury scenario in soybeans where it's suspected that the cause of the herbicide injury was actually the corn herbicide applied the previous year. So this is a herbicide carryover issue. Uh, the corn herbicide in question has active ingredients from the bleaching herbicide family. So these are herbicides that affect carotenoid biosynthesis. Uh, some people refer to them as group 27 herbicides. All this to say is when we get to the field, we should notice that the soybean leaves should express colors that are either white to yellow to brown. They should actually be vibrant colors that just pop. So first and foremost, let's take a look at these symptoms in the field and, and see if they are consistent with uh, the bleaching herbicides. So this is injury symptoms uh, typical of a bleaching herbicide. So here you'll notice if we look at some of these plants, uh, there's very vibrant discoloration of the trifoliate leaves. Uh, some, you know, when it first appears, it almost has a white appearance and then it turns to yellow and then eventually brown. So very distinguished, right? You can see there, that's why I call, they call it a bleaching injury is because it just removes the pigmentation. So here's some more symptomology of the bleaching herbicide. So again, you notice the trifoliate leaf uh, in between the veins, there's that at this stage yellowing. So it usually progresses from white to yellow and then to brown. If we move over to this uh, one, you can see again, the newer trifoliate leaf has along the margins that bleaching injury. Uh, here's an example actually of the progression, right? So the, the older injury, so the injury that occurred first is now necrotic. And then the new, this leaf tissue has along the margin some of that kind of whitening to yellowing. And so in these particular plants here, that's where we see the most uh, severe injury. And there you can see again some bleaching along the, the margins. If we move over to this area, uh, growth looks quite good and we don't see any bleaching symptoms. So that could be a function and a carryover uh, of rate. It could be an overlap rate that's causing this level of, of injury comparatively. So if you had a late herbicide application at the highest labeled rate, you had cool and dry soils and the low pH soil, that's kind of a recipe for seeing or being at risk for bleaching herbicide carryover. What I want to demonstrate here is the influence of rate the previous uh, you know prior to soybeans being planted so here we have a very low rate of a bleaching herbicide we see you know no injury symptomology right looking pretty good so now we're gonna look at an increased rate here we've effectively doubled the rate and so again we see those bleaching herbicide injury symptoms. I think the positive though, when you see it at this level, is that the new trifoliate leaf growth, so always look at the new trifoliate leaf growth. It looks pretty good. Either no, certainly when you look at these plants, a lot of them are affected. They give an appearance of being thinner, especially if we, you know, compare it to there. You know, not as bushy, we've lost some biomass. But typically, our experience has been when you have this kind of injury where it's largely on the lower leaves, the newer leaf tissue looks good. Yes, you've lost some biomass. The yield impact is relatively small, but let's look at yet a higher rate. And so here we have a higher rate. And of course, now the bleaching injury is more pronounced. And now here's a good example where I mentioned earlier that whitening goes to yellow, then goes to brown or necrosis. Um, and even here, some of the newer trifoliate leaf growth, I'll try and get in there for you. You can see on the margins, a little bit of yellowing and discoloration. 
So here with a higher rate, there's now evidence that there is a little bit of translocation to the plant. Um, not lethal, but again, much thinner stand of soybeans here. So let's even look at a higher rate and see the influence. And so here's a, a very high rate then, you know, a, a horrendous misapplication. And here's where you, not only do you see the whitening, yellowing and browning, the, the new growing point is showing significant injury. Um, and in many cases now we get stand loss and plant death. All right, let's tie everything together here. We definitely saw leaf symptoms in the soybeans that are consistent with bleaching herbicide injury. The frustration lies in, you know, why is that happening this year? It's not uncommon to plant soybeans after this group of herbicides. It's done quite often, quite safely. So when we're looking at herbicide carryover, there's a bunch of factors that play a role. I think what's unique about this particular year is that in 2019, it's a cool, wet spring. Uh, planting happened much later. Corn herbicides were applied much later. So in some cases, four to six weeks later. So that's that's a factor because it shortens that duration between application and planting. And then her bleaching herbicides rely on microbial activity to break down in the soil. And so you need warm soils, you need moist soils. And those were two things that were lower than normal over the course of the last year. And then when you get into field specific scenarios, we know that pH plays a role in degradation of bleaching herbicides. So the lower the pH, the, the slower it will degrade. And then characteristics like organic matter and texture play a role. So kind of the worst case scenario is if you had a lower pH soil on sand with lower organic matter, that's a higher risk of seeing herbicide injury. And then you have agronomic factors that can compound or magnify uh, injury or, or make it show up where it maybe normally wouldn't have shown up. So I'm specifically talking about um, compaction or uh, excessive soil moisture or any sort of root diseases. So anything that affects the health of the plant can magnify those symptoms. And so in some cases you might not even see them because the plant can is healthy, it can metabolize the herbicide, but a little bit of compaction, a little bit of flooding or something like that, stresses the plant, can metabolize a herbicide, we see the injury symptoms. So kind of tough to mitigate this happening in future years, but the only thing I could say is uh, paying attention to your soil, the things that you can control, and that's your knowledge of soil characteristics, pH, organic matter, texture, and if they fall in that higher risk category, you might look at herbicides that have a, a shorter recropping window on the crop. So that's a, that's a carryover uh, example from this past year in soybeans. So uh, this is one of our glyphosate resistant water hemp sites. We're in Essex County here. So historically, there were two species of water hemp in North America. There was common water hemp, which was originally from Texas to Nebraska, and then tall water hemp was in Indiana, Ohio, and it's been in Ontario for centuries. However, there's been so much cross-pollination between common and tall water hemp that botanists no longer separate the two species, and it's just simply referred to as water hemp. Now, water hemp is an interesting species. You have both male as well as female plants. And so it's considered to be a dioecious species, and that means it's an obligate cross-pollinating species, and that increases the genetic diversity in that plant, and it makes it such a widely adaptable species. One of the problems with uh, an obligate cross-pollinating species is that you get huge genetic diversity and in Ontario we now have group 2, group 5, group 9 and group 14 resistant water hemp. And I will go through that in more detail as we go through uh, some of the various experiments. So the first glyphosate resistant water hemp was identified in Lambton County from seed collected in 2014, and then over six growing seasons from 2014 to 2019, 
We now know that glyphosate resistant water hemp is in 13 counties in Ontario and it stretches from Essex County in the southwest to Northumberland County on the east side of Toronto. In seven of the 13 counties, we have four-way resistant water hemp. So we have group two, group five, group nine, and group 14 resistant water hemp in seven of those uh, 13 counties. What's also uh, makes it more challenging for farmers to manage uh, water hemp is that this species begins germinating during the month of May, and this species comes up all summer long. And I've had two uh, graduate students now that have documented the emergence pattern of water hemp in Ontario. What they would do is every Monday morning, they would go to these various farm sites. They would count how many water hemp had emerged in the previous seven days. They would spray it off with Liberty and come back the next Monday morning to see how many came up in that seven day period. In contrast to most annual weed species, which have a fairly concentrated emergence pattern between April, May, and maybe into June, water hemp begins emerging in May, and it continues to emerge every week into September and October. So you need a very long residual weed management program to manage this weed in uh, corn and soybean. In terms of the yield loss in uh, corn and soybean, very similar to what I said in, uh, with Canada fleabane, the yield loss is gonna be determined by both the density of the water hemp at each individual site, as well as the relative time of crop and weed emergence. In the studies that we've done in Ontario, in our most competitive environments, there's been up to an 85% yield loss in both corn and soybean. However, the average yield loss in corn is 17%, and the average yield loss in soybean is 43%. we are looking at what are the best soil applied herbicides for managing multiple resistant water hemp in a soybean. So as I mentioned earlier, in the province of Ontario, we have group two, group five, group nine, and group 14 resistant water hemp. The uh, group two resistant water hemp, depending on the amino acid substitution that you have on your farm, it will confer resistance to the sulfonyl ureas like Pinnacle Classic, to the triazolaprimidines like uh, First Rate, and then to the imidazolinones like Pursuit. And then you have uh, group five resistance, and that, uh, once again, depending on the mechanism of resistance on your farm, it either confers resistance to only atrazine, and just in the last couple of years, we now know that there are some farms that have a mechanism of resistance that confers resistance to both atrazine as well as metribuzin. And then finally, in terms of the group 14 herbicides, there are five herbicide families within the group 14 herbicides. They are the phenylpyrazoles, like Blackhawk. Then you have the pyrimidine dions, like saflufenacil the aryl triazinones like authority, you have the phenyl uh, thalamides like Volterra, and finally the diphenyl ethers like reflex. And the uh, mechanism of resistance that confers resistance to the group 14s, confers resistance to all five of those herbicide families applied post-emergence, however soil applied, and I will show you that in just a minute, the group 14 herbicides still uh, work. So here you can see the uh, resistance, or the, the multiple resistance water hemp here on uh, this farm. And really interesting on this farm, it is group two, five, and nine resistant water hemp. So over here, these are Extend Soybean, and Dicamba has good activity on multiple resistant water hemp. However, it provides almost no residual control of water hemp. 
So this is a pre-emergence application of dicamba in Extend Soybean. It will control the water hemp for a 7 to 14 day period. This is the water hemp that came up after the application of dicamba. The next plot that I'd like to show you is the activity of the group 15 herbicides. So within the group 15 herbicides you have dual, frontier, and zidua. And here you can see the activity of dual. It probably gave 85% control of multiple uh, resistant water hemp, but by itself it's not good enough. So this would not be considered to be commercially acceptable by farmers in Ontario. In this plot we have a really effective uh, herbicide. In, uh, here Fierce has been applied. Fierce is a combination of Zidua and Volterra. And in the work that we've done, this has been our best soil applied herbicide for the control of multiple resistant water hemp in Ontario. So uh, just to summarize what we found over the last uh, five years of field research, there are a number of good herbicides in terms of managing multiple resistant uh, water hemp in soybean. Our data says that Fierce is the most efficacious. However, products like Authority Supreme, Boundary, Volterra, Triactor, are also very good starting points in managing this weed in soybean. Due to the uh, extended emergence pattern of water hemp, I think every farmer should plan on a two-pass weed control program to manage this weed. I think there are multiple ways that farmers can manage glyphosate resistant water hemp. In this uh, particular experiment, it happens to be Extend Soybean. And so in this uh, plot, uh, Fierce was applied pre-emergence and then it was followed by a post-emergence application of dicamba. And you can see near perfect uh, control of the glyphosate resistant water hemp in this plot with a two-pass program. You can do that in Liberty Link soybean. Put down your best soil applied herbicide. I think you should think about Boundary, Authority, Supreme or Fierce and then come back with uh, Liberty post-emergence. Or if you have Enlist Soybean, once again start with your best soil applied herbicide and then you can come back with Enlist uh, post-emergence. I will say that over time I think farmers have to be extremely cautious where they use a post-emergence application of either a dicamba based herbicide or a 2,4-D based herbicide post-emergence. We always need to be aware of what crop is in the adjacent field and whether or not it will be susceptible to off-target movement from one of those group 4 herbicides. So uh, this is our first experiment where we're looking at multiple resistant water hemp control in corn. Very similar to uh, soybean. I think all Ontario farmers that have multiple resistant water hemp should plan on a two pass weed control program. What you want to do is put down your best soil applied herbicide and then come back with an effective post emergence herbicide. However, in this particular experiment, we're looking at the interaction between group 27 or HPPD inhibiting herbicides such as Callisto and the group 5 or the photosystem 2 inhibiting herbicides like atrazine. So uh, this plot right behind me, this is the weedy check and you can see the really heavy water hemp pressure and I am sure that there will be more than a 50% yield loss in corn with that density. Right beside it is uh, treatment number two. That is Callisto applied by itself. And I think you would agree with me that that's pretty disappointing control of uh, multiple resistant water hemp with uh, Callisto. And then uh, moving on, here we have number uh, five is atrazine. 
This happens to be a site that has atrazine resistant or group 5 resistant uh, water hemp and you can see the poor control with uh, atrazine. Plot number, uh, this treatment here, number 9, this is bromoxynil or partner. Once again, really disappointing control. Not particularly surprising. Partner is a group 6 uh, herbicide and one of the Achilles heels of the group 6 herbicides is poor control of weeds in the amaranthus family or the pigweed family and you can see the disappointing control with partner. And finally in terms of these herbicides applied alone here you can see uh, Bassagran another group 6 in, uh, herbicide another photosystem 2 inhibiting herbicide and quite disappointing control. So now we'll look at what happens when you combine a group 27 herbicide with a photosystem 2 inhibiting herbicide. Keep in mind that photosystem 2 inhibiting herbicides, the reason why they kill weeds is they increase reactive oxygen species in the plant, which form free radicals that break cell membranes, cell contents leak out, and the plant dies. So that's why you get weed control when you spray atrazine in uh, corn. In contrast to that, the group 27 herbicides stop the production of homogentosate in the plant, which stops the production of plastoquinone and tocopherols, which actually quench free radicals in the plant. So if you combine a group 27 herbicide with a photosystem 2 inhibiting herbicide, what you get in terms of weed control is 1 plus 1 equals 5. And here you will see, this is where Callisto was tank mixed with atrazine, the way that you always use it. And you can see near perfect control of glyphosate resistant water hemp with that tank mix. So in this particular plot, we're looking at the tank mix of Callisto plus Pardner. Keep in mind that Pardner is also a photosystem 2 inhibiting herbicide that increases reactive oxygen species in the plant, just like atrazine does. As many of you are aware, there are some jurisdictions in North America where the use of atrazine is discouraged. There are some watersheds in the United States where you cannot use atrazine, and in the province of Quebec, its uh, use is really limited. So what can those farmers do to uh, maintain the uh, the efficacy of Callisto if you can't uh, combine it with atrazine. And so here we just combined Callisto with another photosystem 2 inhibiting herbicide. In this plot it happens to be Pardner and you can see a dramatically improved control compared to Callisto applied by itself or Pardner applied by itself. So just like I mentioned earlier it's 1 plus 1 equals 5 in terms of the uh, weed control. So as a final example of showing you the interaction between a group 27 and a photosystem 2 inhibiting herbicide, I showed you earlier that Callisto by itself provided very poor control of water hemp. Bassagran by itself provided very poor control of water hemp. And once again, when you combine a group 27 herbicide with a photosystem 2 inhibiting herbicide, Notice the dramatic improvement in control. It's a synergistic response between those two herbicide modes of action. So this is multiple resistant water hemp in corn. As I mentioned earlier, the uh, yield loss in corn due to multiple resistant water hemp in our trials in Ontario is anywhere from 0 to 85%. However, the average yield loss is 17%. So we've done a series of experiments over the years looking at pre-emergence herbicides for the control of water hemp. And in that research, the most efficacious herbicides were things like Converge, Integrity, Callisto plus Atrazine, Lumax, and the best soil applied herbicide is Acuron. And then we did another series of experiments where we looked at post-emergence herbicides at the 5 to 8 leaf stage of corn. And the best herbicides were the group 27s, things like Callisto and Shieldex. However, the question that we were trying to address in this particular experiment 
was what herbicide can a farmer apply at the one to three leaf stage of corn that has both burn down activity as well as full season residual control of glyphosate resistant uh, water hemp. So when I put this experiment together, I contacted all of the agricultural products company. I told them companies, I told them what the ex objective of the experiment was and ask them for their best entries that would provide both burn down activity as full season residual weed control. So I got 13 entries from the various agricultural products companies and 10 out of the 13 treatments provided excellent full season uh, residual control of water hemp with a one pass program applied early post emergence. And so uh, herbicides like Zidua plus Marksman Armazon Pro plus Marksman, uh, On Guard provided excellent control, On Guard with additional atrazine, uh, Shield X, uh, Lumax, Acuron, as well as Halex. So those all were close to 100%. What was interesting to me, there were two treatments that provided quite disappointing control. And so this happens to be Marksman by itself. I showed you earlier with the soybean work that dicamba does not provide residual control of uh, water hemp. And keep in mind, this biotype is resistant to atrazine, so you would expect that Marksman by itself would not provide effective uh, control. And right across the alleyway here, here we have a early post-emergence application of Primextra. Keep in mind that the atrazine and Primextra is going to give you very little control because it is uh, atrazine resistant water hemp. And of the group 15 herbicides, so you think uh, Dual Frontier as well as Zidua, Dual has the least activity on water hemp and you can see the poor control with uh, Primextra. So as Byrne and I were walking out of this particular experiment, this just happens to be Acuron applied early post-emergence. And I just want to show you how effective Acuron is applied early post-emergence. It, it will uh, burn down any emerged water hemp and then it provides full season residual control. And I want to stress that there were nine other herbicide programs that provided a similar level of control to Acuron as you see in this particular plot. So in this scenario, we're going to look at 2,4-D ester 700 injury in soybeans. And so there's, there's really kind of three factors that play a role in seeing this injury. It's, a, it's becoming more of a common tank mix ahead of soybeans, especially when dealing with uh, glyphosate-resistant weeds, specifically giant ragweed. is a very solid treatment. And so if we do see injury, it's more cosmetic than anything else. Uh, it, it typically has no influence on yield, so we'll show you an example of that. But the drivers to whether you see that injury is, is rate. Uh, higher the rate, the more the risk. Uh, the uh, window between application and planting, so the longer you can stretch those two activities, the more likely the herbicide is to to dissipate and then if it is taken up by the roots of the soybean plant then um, it won't be at a level to cause injury and then lastly soil conditions so dissipation of 2,4-D ester in the literature highly dependent on soil moisture so if we have high rate uh, a very short interval between application and planting and then dry soils that does lead us to more injury so let's look at the injury in this particular case here we have a, an example of group four uh, herbicide injury in soybeans with a pre-plant application. Notice there on the unifoid leaves, uh, some refer to that as strapping. You also see the light green discoloration between the veins. Uh, compare that to, you know, a normal trifoliate leaflet there. It's quite a bit of difference in shape and size and so this is typically what you see with uh, pre-plant applications of 2,4-D or haloxifen so the active ingredient in elevore 
And here we have a situation where both active ingredients were applied pre-plant. So 2,4-D ester and uh, elevore. And we just see a little bit more injury. Not every plant. You know, ultimately the new trifoliate leaves actually look pretty good. So that plant will be fine. And we look around here and we see other plants that are perfectly fine. And so maybe that's a combination of just a plant that's maybe not planted as deep, maybe comes into contact with the herbicide a little bit more. Uh, if we look around, we can see more plants. Uh, there's another example of that kind of textbook group for injury on the uh, lower unifoliate leaves. But most of the soybeans that we see here um, are unaffected. So here we see some pretty uh, textbook symptoms of 2,4-D uh, injury when it's applied prior to planting in soybeans, that, that textbook strapping injury. On the positive side, if we look at this plant overall, the new trifoliate leaf looks relatively healthy. If we look at other plants, um, the majority of them are good. You get the odd one here again, like this one, where we see that strapping. And so typically, if we look at how 2,4-D dissipates, 2,4-D uh, ester in particular dissipates in the soil, it's largely driven by moisture and time uh, and just duration, right? So in other words, the riskier situation to cause this type of injury or even worse injury is if the soil is dry and the product is applied very close to planting or even after planting. Uh, if you have plenty of soil moisture and you give more time between the application of 2,4-D, then uh, you're unlikely to see this injury. Big picture, the majority of this stand is uh, very healthy, very little limited strapping. The new growth looks excellent. So the, you know, the risk of injury um, with 2,4-D is surpassed by the benefit of some problem weeds like glyphosate resistant giant ragweed as an example but overall uh, things have recovered nicely so here there are two things playing against us in terms of showing injury one is is product rate so this just happens to be where the sprayer boom uh, was priming so a higher than normal rate went on and then lastly this was applied the day of planting and so you'll see here this kind of textbook 2,4-D injury where we see uh, a fair bit of strapping and then kind of that modeling that sometimes gets associated with uh, viruses. Um, but there is kind of, well, there's a good good one there. Where you see strapping of the trifoliate leaves and that modeling. And in some cases there, like if you look at that, a little bit of cupping, which we often associate with dicamba, but sometimes you can see cupping with other hormone herbicides. Dicamba doesn't have the market cornered on that necessarily. Uh, on the positive side here, we look at the new trifoliate growth, and it's really the uh, older trifoliates that are affected and have that injury. The new trifoliate growth looks good. So uh, these beans, you know, there is some, clearly there are some stunting uh, of the internodes, and there's an effect. Uh, as the, the sprayer got going here, uh, we don't really see any injury symptoms to speak of. And of course, one of the benefits then of being able to use 2,4-D if you have emerged weeds like this. So to recap, 2,4-D injury in soybeans can express itself with trifoliate leaf strapping as we see in this picture, or as leaflet distortion or modeling as seen here, which could also be caused by bean pod model virus. So if you see leaf symptoms that are caused by 2,4-D, the following factors will have influenced the appearance and severity of those symptoms. So first of all, the herbicide rate itself, if we've used rates that are much higher than the labeled rate, that will increase the risk of seeing those symptoms and seeing significant injury. If the amine formulation of 2,4-D is used, it persists longer in the soil and therefore greater risk of seeing injury. If soil moisture is dry, so if soil conditions are dry, this will slow down the rate of dissipation and increase the risk of, of residue being taken up by the plant and causing that injury. 
if we apply this herbicide to coarse textured soils that are low in organic matter, the residue is more likely to be in solution and to be taken up by the soybean hypocotyl, causing that injury. If our planting depth is too shallow, we have a similar occurrence in that now that soybean seed with the radical and the hypocotyl are, are within the herbicide residue layer, can take up product more easily and therefore can have symptoms more easily as well. And then lastly, the duration from application until planting. So the more time we have between those two operations, the more likely the herbicide will dissipate and not cause that injury. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed episode number three of Ontario Diagnostic Days. Uh, lots of information there to digest. Our next episode will be on soil management and soil health. We'll have that for you on August 26th. Mark your calendars. We'll see you then.